All right. Well, we got a future in store for you, and it's coming whether you know it or want it or not. There's a future. It's planned. Even if you were to die tonight, there's a future beyond the grave. We need to know what that future is. The Bible tells us it is a reliable word. Why? Because it's unlike any other book that's ever been written. It has signs of God being the one who wrote it. No other book could have the predictions in it that the Bible has that have come true. And in that book, we read about some things that are going to be hard in this world. First, I'm sorry, John 16, 33, the off-quoted verse reminds us that Jesus, before he left, said, I've told you all this, I've said these things to you, so that in me, if you rely on me, trust in me, have a relationship with me, you may have peace. Now in the world, you're going to have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world, and clearly throughout the New Testament, we see how bad it is for Christians in the world. They're not only made fun of and mocked and ridiculed and maligned, but often persecuted even before the New Testament is over. By the end of the first century, people are being killed and martyred for Christ. And that's going to be hard in this world. There's going to be tribulation in this world. And yet, Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, talks about a different kind of tribulation. It says, for then there will be great tribulation, then, in the future, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. So the word tribulation, we can find that throughout the Bible saying this, if you want to live for Christ in this world, you're going to have trouble, you're going to have persecution, you're going to have tribulation, and perhaps in our day, right now, at least in our little part of the world, you might have people simply making fun of you, excluding you, ridiculing you. In other parts of the world, you can lose your property, you can be incarcerated, you can lose your life, going to prison, lots of other things can happen that are far worse than right now, right here, but we're heading in a direction, certainly in our day where it's getting worse. But Jesus says, listen, there's a whole nother kind of tribulation that's coming. He calls it great tribulation. Elsewhere, it's called the tribulation. So you need to know that the word tribulation is one thing that we're all going to experience, but then there's the great tribulation. Now the word, and here's the difference. The word tribulation comes from a Greek word in the New Testament that means to press upon, to push down upon. Like, to, you know, it's kind of the slow motion version of punching someone to press. Now, the difference between tribulation that we are all going to experience and the tribulation or the great tribulation is simply the one doing the pressing, the one doing the pushing, the one doing the hitting. That's the difference. In other words, if you think about the world pressing against Christians, that's what we're going to have. Satan wants the world to push against you and try and get you to deny Christ, to keep you from your Bible, to keep you from prayer, to keep you from witnessing, telling others about Jesus, to keep you in your place and hopefully getting you to deny Christ. That's what the world and Satan wants. That's the tribulation in the world. But then there's a tribulation where God presses against this sinful world. That's when he starts to push people around, and that's called the tribulation of the world. So you're going to have tribulation in the world just for, for being a Christian. But you're going to have tribulation of the world at the end of time. This is what's going to happen. As Jeremiah 30 verses 6 and 7 say, it speaks of the pains that a woman would go through in giving birth. And he says, now ask and see, can a man bear a child? This is in a prophetic section about the future, this coming great tribulation. Can a man bear a child? Of course not. Then why, he says, do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Why has every face turned pale? Everyone all over the world. Alas, that day is so great. The word means awful. It's so incredible, so incredibly bad. There is none like it. So the period of time that the Bible speaks of that is coming upon the world is the tribulation, the great tribulation, not to be confused with the way the world presses against us. It's God beginning to press against the world. As Daniel 12 verse 1 says, there shall be a time of trouble. Note this, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. 
There's a kind of chaos coming upon the world, the Bible says, over and over and over again. Jeremiah 30, Daniel chapter 12, Matthew 24, and the whole book of Revelation saying there is a time of tribulation coming upon the entire world that's worse than anything that's ever happened in World War I, World War II, anything that you might have read about in the Civil War, anything that might have gone on in, in, in European history or the history of the world, any battle, any war, it's going to be worse. So right now, the current stage of things, we're going to have tribulation. We're going to have wars and rumors of wars, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, but that doesn't mean the end is here yet. That's not the end. That's just the beginning of birth pangs. You're going to have people reeling in pain. There's going to be a kind of tribulation in the world that you just can't call a tribulation. It's the tribulation. It's the great tribulation. Now, we said last night, here's our layout. We're going to get raptured. The Bible says, I think very clearly at that time, we can expect the resurrection of the bodies of all those that have died before that day. We're going to have the Bema Seat Judgment, which we're going to talk about in a couple days. The Marriage Supper of the Lamb, which we'll also talk about going on at the same time. But on the earth during that time, we have the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, you have the return of Christ. Those are the things we're going to talk about, including this one, the battle of Armageddon. That's our topic for tonight. These things, the tribulation, the return of Christ, and by that I mean when he comes to earth, not meeting us in the air, but coming back to the planet. Then there's the millennial kingdom, the great white throne judgment, the lake of fire, and eternity. So we'll get to all that later in the week, Lord willing. So when is this all going to start? Jesus made it very clear. He's not going to tell us when it's going to start, but we know the things that are going to happen. It's going to happen when the church is removed, when the people in this era, in this time, during this period of history are taken out of the world. The Bible says in a book that speaks so much about the end times, 1 Thessalonians and also in 2 Thessalonians as well, it says, listen, God has not destined us for wrath, which is how this whole period of time is described. When God starts pressing against the world, just like Moses, I'm sorry, just like Noah was removed from the world before the flood came and destroyed it, just like that, the church is going to be removed. God's people are going to be removed. We're not destined for that. We're not planned for that. God hasn't signed us up for wrath, but he's signed us up. He's destined us for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And like the passages we saw yesterday afternoon, to be taken up, to be harpazo, taken out of the world, that's the plan. Now, when does it start? Well, there's another thing that marks the beginning of this. When a world leader, not a world leader, the world leader, someone who's in charge of the world, we'll look at this more in a minute, makes a contract to give Israel peace. Israel, I don't know if you know this, all you got to do is search Google News for what's going on in Jerusalem and Israel. It's the most embattled part of the world. No one likes Israel in the Middle East. The only democracy out there in the Middle East and every nation around it hates Israel. They're in constant warfare, and they have since they reassembled in 1947. So much going on in 1967, all the wars and battles with Egypt and Syria and Iraq and Iran, all kinds of warfare. But there's going to be someone who comes on the world scene and says, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you protection. As Daniel chapter 9, 27 says, this leader, this world leader shall make a strong covenant, a firm covenant, a contract, a promise for one week, which in that passage is defined as a seven-year period. So that leads us to the next question. Should very obvious based on that verse. How long will the tribulation last? Well, Revelation 11 and 12 and Daniel chapter 9 describe it in the clearest possible terms. Not only is it called a week or a set of seven years, it's described as two 42-month periods. Two 42-month periods. So we have 42 months and then 42 months. That's 84 months. The total of that is a seven-year period. So for seven years, we're going to have the worst period of time on human history, the Bible says. Why do I trust the Bible? Because everything it's promised about everything in the past has come true. Every single promise and prophecy that God has given us through the prophets in the scripture has come true. And so the promises that Jesus made, who rose from the dead, he says all of these things are going to happen. He speaks about it at length. As he stands on the Mount of Olives, it's called the Olivet Discourse. He preaches on the Mount of Olives about all these end times events and sure enough, we have a promise in Scripture that a 42-month plus 42-month period, a seven-year period, is going to be the worst ever. Now, in the meantime, as we ramp up to that, things are going to get worse. But don't think we've entered into the Great Tribulation until the church is gone and this covenant or this contract is made with a world leader. 2 Timothy 3 says, listen, understand this. In the last days, there will come times of difficulty. 
So clearly, we're going to have times of difficulty. People are going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, can't please them, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving the good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's the world we live in. And in that world, all those people are going to press hard against Christians in the church. So that's going to be the way it is. It's going to go from bad to worse. But then there's going to be a period when the great tribulation starts. And the church is going to be taken out of the way and a world leader is going to make a covenant. Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, describes what's going on. Let's describe the two basic component parts of the tribulational period. It speaks of the nations raging, which is a statement that's drawn from Psalm 2, which says that's always the way it's been. The nations don't want to submit to God. That's why the people of this world press against the church. They persecute the church. The people that do submit to God are always mocked and made fun of and ridiculed. Nevertheless, they rage all they want, but God now is going to start to press against them. Your wrath has come, but the time of your wrath, it came. And the time for the dead, that means the spiritually unsaved, those who are not Christians, to be judged. So we understand this, that the great tribulation is primarily God judging the world. Just like he judged the world at the time of Noah, he said, I'm going to save the planet between the time of Noah with this rainbow he puts in the sky. He says, I'm not going to destroy the world with water, but I'm going to come back a second time and destroy the world with fire. When I say come back, he's coming to the planet to judge the planet. Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21 says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, we'll talk about those plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor did they give up worshiping demons, which the Bible says anything you worship other than God is demonic. It's, even though it doesn't look like it, it can look like idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone. And in our day, there's all kinds of things that people worship. Things they cannot see, these idols they can't hear, they can't walk. They didn't repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts. So there's all this bad stuff going on that continues from this age into the next age, only it's going to be a lot worse. People are not repenting. God is judging the world. There's another element to it that's going on. Revelation chapter 7 verse 4 says this, I heard the number of the sealed. 144,000 sealed from every tribe. That means God's picked them out, and it says in this passage he's put his name on them. That means there are now Christians in the tribulational period. We don't, we don't have any explanation how they start to become Christians other than the fact they have the Bible, and they start reading the Bible during this period, and it starts with 144,000 from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So think about this now. You've got all these people in Israel right now, and I've gone to Israel several times. I sit there and I talk to Israelis about Christ, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. They're not interested in it. They have an Old Testament just like I have. They read the Old Testament, but all those passages about Jesus, they're not interested in seeing. Sometimes I sit there and I say, why can't you see the things that are just evident in plain? Well, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, it's because their eyes are blind. But one day, God's going to remove that blindness from their eyes. They're going to be able to look at their Old Testament and see, hey, everything that Jesus did in the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And it's going to start with 144,000. That's a lot of people. 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Revelation 7, verse 10 in that same passage says, people are going to be crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That is to Christ. So I've got Israelis during the tribulational period getting saved. We don't see in the scripture how they're saved other than the fact that they have a Bible. They turn to Christ. The church is gone, but they're left with the scriptures. And in the scriptures, they find the truth about who Jesus is. And they start worshiping God and Christ, the Lamb. And there's two very, very interesting characters called the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 11... These two guys are doing what the 144,000 are doing, but they are actually performing miracles during this period of time. Miracles. The Bible's very clear that the coming of the Bible came with these miracles that people could see so that they would believe that the written word is the word of God. Well, we have the word of God, so we don't need any more miracles. Sometimes we wish that God would do some miracles for us, but we have the Bible that's been attested. It's been verified by the miracles of the guys that wrote it. And for 2,000 years now, we haven't had the miracles like we had in the Bible where people are coming along and just 
saying, hey, take up your mat and walk, and having people that have never walked, they've been paralyzed their whole life, starting to walk, or blind men seeing, all those things. People like Lazarus raising from the dead. Well, now, during the period of the tribulation, you got two guys, two Miracle-working prophets, it says here. They're given authority by God, God speaking here, my two witnesses, and they're going to prophesy. They're going to preach. They're going to speak now, much like you had the prophecy of, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You had these prophets that spoke the truth. You're going to have some prophets now in the last seven-year period on planet Earth. They're clothed in sackcloth, which is a way that they were showing in the Old Testament that they were repentant that they felt bad about their sin and thought that other people should turn from their sin. So they're wearing this kind of a really plain burlap sack, if you will. And anyone who tries to harm them, this is a very interesting thing. You don't want to go up against these two witnesses because fire pours out of their mouth and consumes their foes. And if anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Now, you know, that's going to get some attention during the tribulational period. And a lot of people are going to say those two guys that are speaking about God during this period, and now you've got 144,000 Jewish missionaries going around and getting people to say salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb, you're going to have a lot of people coming to Christ. So during this great tribulational period, just realize that what we have in the book of Revelation is all about Israel. Israel is the focus of it. Israel is what this is all about. Oh, I said it's all about God pressing against the world. That's the first part of what it's all about. The other thing that God is doing simultaneously at the very same time is he's getting his people ready for the millennial kingdom. His people, by that I mean Israel. Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 says 70 weeks, that's 70 sets of seven years are decreed, they're decided by God about your people and your holy city. And the last week on that calendar is the great tribulational period. So we know the great tribulational period has a purpose. The good purpose is to get Israel ready to receive the Messiah and live on that earth during that millennial kingdom. Look at this passage, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. I quoted part of it already. There shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, same sentence here, your people shall be delivered. Daniel, of course, is a Jewish person. He's in Babylon at the time he gets this prophecy. And this is about the fact that there'll be a great time of tribulation, but God is going to save a group out of that. He's going to deliver a group out of that, a group of Israelis, a group of Jewish people. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, I quoted this one, this day is so great, so awful that there is none like it. Now, I, I quoted that for you, but here's the rest of the, of, of the verse. It is a time of distress for Jacob. That's the way... We, that's a shorthand for describing Israel. Jacob's other name was Israel, the nation of Israel. He, yet he, even though it's distressing for him, shall be saved out of it. The picture in the scripture is that during this seven-year period of time, God has decreed that Israel would be filled with people coming to Christ. At the same time, the world is falling apart. The great tribulation, it's worse than any other period of time. If you're going to ask, what is the tribulation about? Well, here's the first thing. It's to punish the world, and it's to convert Israel to Jesus. If you don't learn anything else tonight, remember that. The tribulation is punishing the world. Now, was everyone before that sinful too? Sure, just like in the flood. Every generation before the flood, they were sinful also. It just got worse and worse and worse. And in the last times, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And then that last generation, God is going to come and judge them just like he judged the generation of Noah. But out of that generation, he saved Noah's family. And so it is in the tribulation. He's going to reach out through the scripture and the testimony of these two prophets or the two witnesses, as they're called in the book of Revelation, and the 144,000 Jewish missionaries from the 12 tribes of Israel, and all these people are going to start getting converted to Jesus. Now, the Bible says that influence is going to be so great during that seven-year period that people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, every language, every people group, every ethnicity, from those nations, people are going to start to get saved during the tribulational period. The book of Revelation speaks of this seven-year period, and it talks about it in three categories. There are seals, there are trumpets, and there are bowls. Okay, look at that. Seals, trumpets, and bowls. Seals. In the old days, a book was not a book like we have it. I guess the only equivalent would be if there was a latch on a book. Sometimes you have a diary like that with a latch and a lock. Well, in the olden days, they'd take a scroll, and if they didn't want the messenger to read it, 
Today we just lick an envelope and seal it, and we know if it's been tampered with. Well, in the old days, they had a scroll. They'd put a seal on it. They'd get heat up wax. They'd put a signet ring or some kind of impression on it, and they'd seal it shut. That way, they knew if anyone tried to tamper with it, someone had been looking inside of it. Well, if you rolled out the scroll, you can imagine as you roll out the scroll, you could seal up certain segments of it. In other words, you could roll it just a little ways and put a seal on it and then roll it some more and put another seal on it and roll it some more and put another seal on it. Roll it some more and put another seal on it. Roll the last flap over and put the final seal on it. Well, the Bible says there's seven seals on a scroll that describe this seven-year period. So seven segments of information in a scroll that start to be, it starts to be discussed in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 where we're going to learn about what goes on during the tribulational period. Then, just like in ancient battle, they would blow a horn, they'd blow a trumpet, and they'd call people to battle. Of course, this is a terrible time of a lot of warfare. There's seven trumpets that are blown that are described in the book of Revelation regarding what happens in the seven-year tribulational period. And then there were bowls. Bowls, in this case, of pouring out something that was hot and molten, something painful. Just like in the olden days, they'd forge steel or iron or whatever it might be, some kind of metal, they'd heat it up, they'd get it molten hot, and they could pour it out. That's the picture of something painful, something fiery. And these bowls are describing what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation. So these seven years are described in the book of Revelation with seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. Let's quickly understand how bad this time is going to be by looking at them real quick. Number one, the first seal that is opened in Revelation chapter 6 talks about the fact that the first thing we see in the tribulational period is the Antichrist taking power. The Antichrist taking power. There's lots of names for the Antichrist in the Bible. He's talked about in terms of things that describe him as a strong leader, as someone who's a dominant dictator, as someone who's not righteous. He's a man of lawlessness. He's just so aggressive, everyone else fears him. He's called the beast in the Bible. He's called the Antichrist, the beast. He's someone who's going to lead the world. 2 Thessalonians describes him as a political leader. He's leading the world like a, like a dictator in a country. Instead of a country, though, he's leading the whole world. Here in this passage, here's one of the titles I just gave you, the man of lawlessness. He's revealed, the Bible says. He's a son of destruction. There's another name for him because God's going to destroy him at the end of the seven-year period. He opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God, every leader, every boss, every king, every lord, every manager, every president, every lawmaker, or any object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God. Now, the focus of the 70th week of Daniel, this period of time where you're going to have Israel being saved, is the temple in Jerusalem, and he's going to take his seat in the temple of God and proclaim himself to be God. Now, that's a guy with a healthy self-esteem there, right? He's pumping himself up, and he thinks that he himself is God. Now, how are you going to get people to think he's God? Well, the Bible reveals another person who's going to be revealed to promote the Antichrist. It's a world religious leader. There's a lot of religious leaders in this world, but there's going to be one dominant religion during the period of the tribulation, and that religious leader is described in Revelation chapter 13. He's called another beast. He's someone else that other people are scared of. He's got a lot of power but he's not a political dictator. He's a religious dictator. And the Bible says he's going to come out of the earth. He's really not about heaven. He's not about truth. He's not about God. He's not about Christ. He has two horns like a lamb. He's really strong, like a ram that would go out and, and be able to bowl things over. And this beast, it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast. Just like you saw everyone kind of cowering to the political leader, this religious leader is going to be just as feared and its presence, this beast's presence, it's going to make the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Now that's something. You get two leaders that are really strong. You think they might be polarized. And you get the following of the one and then the following of the other. But in this case, the second world leader, who's a religious leader, who's going to be on the scene at the same time as the Antichrist, is going to have all this religious power while well, you have a political leader. And that religious leader is going to say everyone should be worshiping the political leader. He becomes like a priest to the God of the world leader. The Bible says everyone is going to be asked and demanded to give their loyalty, to pledge their allegiance and loyalty to this world leader. He's a beast. He's, a, he's an antichrist. He's a man of lawlessness, a son of destruction. He's a world political leader. 
And the Bible says that people are going to be told that if they're going to sell or buy anything, they've got to put something on their forehead or the back of their hand. Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18 says that this beast is going to cause all, both small and great. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're a important political leader or whether you're just a normal guy in a normal city in a normal town, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now the Bible says this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, this political leader, this antichrist. For, the, for it's the number of man, not the number of God. He's not from heaven. He's from earth. He's an, a, a non-Christian, anti-Christian leader. And his number is, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, 666. Everyone wants to know, what does that mean? And that's a really good question, but what we know is that the people in that tribulational period are going to have the Bible. The Bible, I mean, trust me, you're going to go to Bible study during the tribulational period if you're interested in God and looking very carefully to understand what's going on in the current time, this seven-year period. And you're going to read that number and you go, I get it. I know exactly what that is. It's something that is going to pledge this loyalty to this world leader. I mean, this is the idea. I can't buy or sell, so there's pressure to get it. But these people are vowing allegiance to this beast or this political leader. Now, all of this leads to a lot of speculation, and everyone's trying to figure out what the 666 is. And all I can tell you is when it's happening and you read that, you're going to get it and you're going to know it. God, like a lot of things in the Bible, tells us what's going to happen with great specificity. It's very specific. And yet, we don't really know what it means until it happens. And every time we've seen that in the Old Testament, it comes true. And it's exactly, you can see very clearly in hindsight what that means. So we don't know what that number is. It's not a credit card. It's not a, you know, a chip. It's not a, uh, you know, some fancy technology. It's not your iPhone. It's not Apple Pay. It's none of that. This is something that people are getting so people can see it and say, I am loyal to the political leader. And the most incredible leader in the religious realm that the Bible says is doing false miracles and wonders at the time. He's going to say everyone should worship this person. Everyone should have this kind of tattoo or this mark on the back of their hand or their forehead. And from that, they're able to buy and sell and function. So I can't answer what 666 is, and no one else can either. All they can tell you is, is crazy theories. And every year, someone comes out with a new theory. But when this is happening and the church is gone and the leader makes a covenant with the nation of Israel for peace and protects them for the first three and a half years, the first 42 months, and then they ask you to get this mark, everyone's going to know. I get it. I understand it. And we're going to know what that number means right now. We don't know. So seal number one is the rise of the Antichrist. Seal number two is warfare, worldwide warfare. So far, we've had two wars that we called world wars. Well, there's going to be another world war. I don't know if it'll be three or four or five, depending on what happens between now and then, because things will get worse, and there will be wars and rumors of wars. But right now, I know that whatever that last series of wars is during the Great Tribulational Period, it's going to be worldwide. It's going to be terrible. There's going to be peace taken from the earth. No one's going to be sitting on their front porch in a rocking chair, feeling at ease and secure, because all of that security and peace is going to be gone, and there will be warfare around the world. And with warfare, as is often the case, you're going to have economic collapse. You're going to have all these things in the world that you used to be able to afford. You won't be able to afford them anymore. The banks are going to crash. People are not going to have money. That's why this leverage, this pressure from the Antichrist to have people take this mark is going to be so easy to do because people are going to be hungry for food. They're going to be hungry for things they need, the commodities of life. And during that economic collapse, this world leader is going to take advantage of all that fear and all that warfare and people are going to pledge their allegiance to this world leader. The fourth seal, as this scroll is being unraveled, is that a quarter of the world is going to die. The Bible says that all the things that we fear about death, they're all going to come true for a quarter of the people that are either going to die by, here's the list, either by sword in the wars or in famine and pestilence. So we're going to have a lot of bad things, a lot of illnesses, a lot of sicknesses, a lot of epidemics in, in, in health care, and certainly because we've got everyone dying in these world wars, you're going to have a quarter of the population die. If you just think about that, go into any city and think, okay, here's a lot of people. What if a quarter of them died in a matter of months? It's going to be huge. People are going to be weeping and crying for the loss of all kinds of people that they knew. 
Oh, and by the way, what about all those Christians that are getting saved, those Israelis and even those Gentiles, those non-Israelis that are starting to get saved? Well, the Bible says they're going to start to get executed. People are going to start cutting their heads off. Do we have that now? Yeah, we have some of that now, but it's going to happen on a scale that we've never seen before. If people say, I want to follow Christ, and they say, I'm not going to get this mark of the beast on the back of my hand or my forehead. I'm not going to vow my allegiance to this political leader. I don't care what the great religious leader of the world says. You're going to have to pay with your life. You won't have food. You will have warfare going on. You'll have economic uncertainty. You won't be able to afford anything. And if you don't starve to death, if you, if you pledge your loyalty to Jesus during this period of time, you're going to be hunted down. And they're going to try to kill all the servants, as it says, of the Lord. Number six, there's going to be a great earthquake. That's the sixth seal. We've had a little shaking around here, but nothing like you're going to have during the big earthquake during the great tribulational period. Every mountain and every island, it says, will shake. The kings of the earth and the powerful people are going to hide themselves, it says. They're going to be so scared, this passage says, they're going to hide themselves in caves among the rocks, calling on the mountains and the rocks, say, fall on us and hide us. They'll recognize the world's falling apart. It's falling apart at the seams. This must be God unleashing his anger at us. They'll get it. They'll understand it. And they'll say, hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. How do they know all that? Well, the 144,000 Jewish missionaries are going out and telling everyone all over the world about Christ. People are starting to see, you got to make a decision. I'm going to be loyal to the world and this world leader, or I'm going to be loyal to Christ. And they're going to recognize when the world starts falling apart with earthquakes and pestilence and war and famine and economic collapse. And certainly during this great earthquake, they're going to be so scared. They're going to say, I wish we just would die in the earthquake. I'm just tired of facing all these terrible things that God is pouring out on this earth. Number seven, the last of the seals is simply an announcement at the beginning of the trumpets. It says there's going to be silence between the last seal and the first trumpet. There's silence for a half an hour, it says. That's a strange way to put it. What does that mean? I don't know. I guess it's going to be silent for half an hour. But after that, the Bible says you're going to start hearing the trumpet blasts. And of course, this is a way to describe how things are going to go from bad to worse. Now, you've already had a quarter of the people on the planet die. Well, the first trumpet is that 33% of what's left on earth in terms of the, the inhabitable landmass is going to be set on fire. Think about that. I mean, we have occasional summer fall fires in California, and sometimes it gets really bad. We had the worst ones last year, I think it was, that we've ever had in California history, at least in recent history. And I mean, that just displaces people. It's chaos. Well, think about if 33% of the whole country was on fire. That's the first thing that we see in Revelation chapter 8. You got a third of the sea turned to blood, and it says when it does, a third of all the sea creatures are dead. They die, and they're destroyed. And the ships that are in the ocean, whatever's in this blood, whatever this makeup of the ocean water is at that point, it's going to destroy and sink these ships. You got a 33% of the entire ocean at that point going to be destroyed. The third trumpet is 33% of the fresh water supply is going to be poisoned. It's going to become something that's undrinkable. You won't be able to drink it. People are going to die from drinking the water. 33% of the water supply now is not drinkable. Trumpet number four in Revelation chapter eight, it says 33% of the light from the sky is dimmed. If you got a third of the nation of the world on fire, Think about this. And you've got something going on with the water that turns 33% of the water, a third of the water to blood, and all the fresh water now is being poisoned. It's not hard for us to imagine the kind of stuff that you would have in the atmosphere that would create what is called in this passage the darkening of the moon and the stars and the sun. You've got a third of all the light in this planet dim. Number five, the fifth trumpet sounds. And you're going to have something called locusts. We're not sure exactly what these are, these are some kind of weird demonic spirits that are launched on the world. But whatever they are, they're described like these flying pests that come into your life, sting you and make you sick and cause you to be tortured. It says they were allowed to torment people for five months. It's gonna, this plague is going to last for five months. But it's not going to kill them. It's only going to torment them. It's going to make them sick. It's going to be like the torment of a scorpion bite when it stings someone. I'm quoting now from Revelation chapter 9. But what this is, we're not sure. It's very strange. If you read this, it's a very bizarre description. 
But whatever it is, you don't want to be a part of this, and these are being unleashed all over the world. Trumpet number six blast, and 33% of the people are simply killed by angels. It's not described how, but the angels go out and they kill a third of, of, the, of the remaining of the pop population. We'd already lost a quarter of the population. Now we got another third of what's left. They die. Number seven, the seventh trumpet sounds, and when it does, there's an announcement. It's a passage I quote all the time, that the kingdoms of the world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. It's an announcement of the fact that Christ is coming, that Christ's done with this world, that Christ is going to put an end to all government here on the planet. Now, it's not yet going to happen because there's going to be these bowls that are going to be poured out on the planet. But trumpet number seven simply says it's, it's going to be over here real soon. And the seven bowls then are revealed. And what are the seven bowls? They start to be described in Revelation chapter 16. And the first thing, as though it weren't bad enough on the planet, people are going to have bodily sores. They're going to have bodily sores. They're going to be so bad that they're going to be in, in, in retching pain. And the Bible says that everyone in this case is targeted with these sores if they've gotten the mark on the hand or on their forehead to pledge their allegiance to the world leader. And this is one of the plagues that is given here that is directed to those who have already decided they're going to be loyal to the Antichrist. Bowl number two that gets poured out on the, on the earth, we've already had a third of the sea destroyed, and we're right here at the very end. We're almost to the end of the tribulation. The rest of the sea is destroyed. All sea life is destroyed. Every living thing, it says the sea becomes like the blood of a corpse, and everything that, in it, that is in it has died. So we've gone from partial destruction of the oceans to a complete destruction of the ocean. The third bowl poured out is just like the other one. We had part, a third of the fresh water supply poison. Now it says in the third bowl, we have all of the fresh water on the planet that is now poisoned. The fourth bowl is the temperatures on the planet increased. It says the angel then, he allows the sun to scorch people as like it's fire. They scorch them with severe and fierce heat. And the people cursed the name of God because of the plagues, and yet they did not repent. So you got people still shaking their fist at God. you got an angry mob, and the temperature's getting ratcheted up. I mean, we think it's hot when it hits 100 degrees. It doesn't tell us how hot it's going to be, but it's going to be unprecedented heat around the world. Number five, the bowl's going to be poured out. Number five, which is darkness and increased pain. It's an interesting statement. It doesn't tell us exactly why, but it says there's going to be darkness in the kingdom, the kingdom of the Antichrist, and people are going to gnaw their tongues in anguish, and they're going to curse the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores. And yet, they don't repent of their sinful deeds. Darkness and increased pain. We've already seen, now these follow the, the trumpets, right? We've seen part of the sky being dimmed, but now it's going to get really dark on the planet. Number six, they're going to gather for battle. You're going to see things change in the Middle East. The topography and the geography of the Middle East is going to change so that people can come and assemble for a great and final battle. That's the sixth bowl. Demonic spirits are going to go out, it says, in this period of time, performing signs. They're going to go and assemble and draw the kings of the whole world to a great battle. And then the last one, the very last bowl, the last of the bowl judgments is the great earthquake, an earthquake that's going to destroy the cities around the world along with hail, some kind of hail, something's going to come from the sky that's going to start to destroy the cities, and you're going to see the earth quaking like it never has before, and it's described in that passage as taking cities and splitting them into three parts, and the nation, the cities of all the nations falling and God, it says, draining the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. He's unleashing his full anger at the world at this particular point. And great hailstones are coming, a hundred pounds each. They're falling from the sky on people, and they're cursing God for the plagues of the hail because it was so severe. A hundred pound hailstones during this period of time. So the world's going to be in a heap of mess. If you don't get that picture, and all I'm doing is itemizing what's in the Bible. You can read it for yourself. You see all these terrible things happening. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 says, After all the seals and the trumpets and the bowls, the lawless one, the Antichrist, who's revealed, is, in, is going to end up, during that period he's been revealed, he's going to end up being destroyed. The Lord Jesus is going to come back after all of that. 
and will kill him with the breath of his mouth and bring to, he'll be brought to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So everything has been assembled for a great battle. The war is about to take place and that's going to trigger Christ coming back. We can assume there's a great battle going on between the people that have the mark and the people that don't have the mark. And of course, most people have the mark and they're loyal to the Antichrist, but there's going to be a group of Christians who are faithful and loyal to Christ. Primarily, Israel is the focus of this because all these people are turning now to Christ, to Jesus Christ of the New Testament, and they all now are coming to a great battle in Israel. It's a battle called Armageddon. This is a picture of a place called Megiddo. Armageddon, or actually, if you were to say it properly, Har, in Hebrew, Har, it means mountain or hill. Har Megiddo, or Armageddon, is the place where this battle is going to take place. If you look at it in terms of its topography, this huge valley, this Jezreel Valley, it's a place where you can put a ton of, of, of hardware for war. I've been here. Some of you may have been to Israel with us and have gone and to visit this place. It's an ancient city, but it's this huge plain where the Bible says the final war is going to take place where everyone is assembled and Christ is going to come back. If you want some geography here, you can see the Dead Sea. Lake Kinneret is another name for the Lake of uh, Sea of Galilee. Kinneret means harp because it's in the shape of a harp. But there's where Megiddo is. And you can see the sea coast and that little circle up there on the Mediterranean Sea. It's the biggest port in Israel, and you're going to have ships coming in for battle. You're going to have all the tanks or whatever exists at that time. If it's in our day, certainly going to have jets and everything else flying in there. And the Bible says, after they assemble for that battle, Christ is going to come back. And here's how it's described. It's a weird thing to try and imagine and to envision, but this is what the Bible says. At the end of this time, when everyone has hated God. They've shaken their fist at God. They don't want to repent. It says out of the sky, heaven's going to be open and behold a white horse and one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. So Christ is coming back to engage in warfare. We're assuming here clearly to save the people who've put their trust in him during the tribulation. Primarily the focus is on Israel. So he's coming back to save the Israelis who've become followers of Jesus Christ and his eyes are a flame of fire. I mean, he just looks at these armies that are assembled against Israel and he's going to wipe them out. And on his head are many diadems, many crowns. He's got all the majesty of heaven. Christ is fully glorified at this point. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. What is that about? Don't know. Only he knows. Don't ask me. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, which reminds us he died for the sins of the people that are trusting in him. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. That's how the book of John starts. He's, he's the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. This expression of all that God is to the planet, the Word of God, Jesus Christ. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he's going to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He's not going to mess around. He's going to subject all the people to himself. They're going to die physically at this particular point. And again, the poetic scene of his anger toward the sinful world. He will tread out the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All this, by the way, is in the New Testament. If you think that people dismiss the Old Testament because it's mean and it's got a lot of wrath in it and God's angry. This is all New Testament truth. God is gracious. It's a time right now for us to cling to his mercy. We focus on his love. We sing about his grace. But God looks at a world of people that reject that grace and that, and that gospel, and he's going to come back at the end of time in the great tribulation. It's the over and over repeated promise of prophecy in the scripture. And he's going to finish this in the valley of Megiddo. And we assume as he comes down from heaven to engage in this battle, which is not too far from Jerusalem, he'll finally make his way back down that valley in the middle of Jerusalem, I'm sorry, in the middle of Israel to the city of Jerusalem, and his feet are going to touch the ground for the very first time since he left it. As it says in Acts chapter 1, he ascended there at the end of his earthly ministry from the Mount of Olives. They watched him go. The angel said he's going to come back and touch his feet down right here in the same place, the same place you saw him go. He's going to come back. And it says in Zechariah, the Old Testament prediction of this, the Lord will go out. He'll fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. That's the battle of Armageddon. 
And on that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. New Testament says that's exactly what's going to happen. This was predicted long before that took place when Jesus ascended and those angels told the disciples he's coming back. He's going to come back. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives that lie before Jerusalem on the east. This is a picture of it, by the way, looking to the east. This is the wailing wall, the foundational wall of the temple, which will be rebuilt at that particular time, which is not in the picture, but will be then. And on the Mount of Olives, it'll be split in two from east to west in a very wide valley so that one half of the mountain shall be moved northward and the other half is going to be moved southward. That's a strange thing, but God's going to come back. Of course, the incarnate God, Jesus Christ, touches feet on the Mount of Olives and you're going to have this geographic topological change to the Mount of Olives. When we talk about Christ coming back, he's going to come back to get his church in the air. He's going to come back to the planet through all these judgments in anger toward the earth. And then he's going to come back to save Israel. And his feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. And he's going to set up a kingdom that we're going to talk about tomorrow. It's going to last for a thousand years. So what do we do with all this? Armageddon. Some people call it doomsday. Maybe you've seen this TV program on the Nat Geo channel. Doomsday preppers. Well, maybe we ought to get ready, right? We get all of our stuff. We can manage all this. We can prepare ourselves for the worst time in all of history. If you watch this show, by the way, you see a lot of people like this, and I think they're not going to get real far. I'll give them an A for effort, but uh, they're not going to make it, right? All these things are going to be gnawing their tongues, the Bible says, and they're going to be begging to die, and yet they won't repent of their sins. As a matter of fact, the Bible paints a picture of the world being angry, increasingly angry during the tribulational period. What do we do? Well, I guess you could just wait to see if any of this happens, right? Maybe you could reject the gospel right now because it's not all that bad. Earth and life's pretty good down here. A lot of people say all this stuff about the predictions of the rapture and the tribulation. If that actually happens and all these Christians that I knew are gone and all this bad stuff starts to happen, well, then I'll become a Christian. At least I'll go to heaven when I die. I wouldn't count on that, and here's why. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12 says this, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, who, by the way, he has a great sales pitch. He came and deceived Eve in the garden, and she knew God personally, walked in fellowship with God in the garden, and yet Satan was able to deceive her. And here comes the lawless one with the activity of the enemy, with the activity of Satan working in him, with all the power and false signs and wonders, so he's doing miracles, and all the wicked deception of those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Look at that now. They refuse during this period of time to love the truth and be saved. There are some of you right now that don't love the truth and you're refusing to be saved. Well, one day you're going to have a leader He's going to come with all the powers and signs and wonders, and he's going to impress you. And he's going to have all the wicked deception that's going on even in our day that's probably getting you to the place of saying, I don't want to become a Christian. That's only going to ramp up. And the Bible says, and God's going to look at people that have rejected Christ during this period, and he's going to send them a strong delusion, not a mild one, a strong one, so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Some of you right now are saying, I'm not going to be a Christian. I don't want to be a Christian. I want to have fun. I'm going to live my life the way I want to. I don't want God to be in charge. And all I'm saying is you're going to be deceived because right now you've been given the gospel plainly. You know what the gospel is. You know what it is to respond rightly to God in repentance and faith. If you say, well, I'll figure this out if it all happens, then I'll get saved and at least I can go to heaven and spend eternity with God. And I'm saying, I doubt it. Will people get saved during the tribulation? Yes. But the focus primarily is on Israel being saved and then all the tongues and tribes and nations, all the people outside of that, the Bible says the gospel is going to reach into places it has never been before. There's a lot of places that haven't had the privilege of having the gospel preached to them. And the Bible says these angels are going to go throughout the sky proclaiming the good news, the gospel of God. And people are going to start to hear it who have never heard it, and they're going to respond. But the people that have sat at Christian camp in the summer, hearing the message over and over again, if we all get raptured who are real Christians tomorrow, and the Antichrist comes to power, and everyone gets to see that all the things I just said are actually true, 
I'm telling you, God's already promised he's going to send a strong delusion. Even though you know better, you're going to start to believe what is false. Why? Because he's looking at you saying, you didn't believe the truth. You didn't love the truth. You had pleasure in unrighteousness. What should Christians do? Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 13 says, well, the day of the Lord's coming like a thief. As we said, he's not telling us when. It could start tonight. It could start next week. It could start five years from now. And the heavens are going to pass away with a roar. If you want specificity to that, you can talk about the seals and the trumpets and the bulls. There's a lot going on. The heavenly bodies are going to be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Everyone's going to be put into two camps at that point. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, if this world is going to be burned up, then what sort of people ought you to be, present tense, right now, in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, looking forward to it, the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars are going to melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we right now should be waiting for, longing for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The problem is I'd like to be optimistic and think everyone in the room is going to get saved this week. Everyone's going to be Christians, everybody who came here saved, only going to be more excited about following Christ. The non-Christians here are going to get right with God. But the world and the enemy, very deceptive. That's why we're constantly warned, don't love this world. There's a lot about this world that you're going to like. It's going to feel good to you. But the Bible says you've got to fight this. Don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the desire of the flesh, all the things I naturally want, the desire of the eyes, all that stuff I want to get, all the pride of life, all the self-promotion. It's not from the Father. It's not from God. That's from the world. And the world, this ought to be the thing that makes you think this is a bad investment. It's passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. You can pursue, like most teenagers in this world, a life of fun and happiness, just like your parents have wrongly told you probably your whole life. They've said, oh, I just want you to be happy. Well, I don't want you to be happy. I'd like you to be holy. I don't want you just to have fun in life. I'd like you to get right with God before it's too late. That's what I want. And then I want you to start doing what Colossians 3 says, and that is to start setting your minds on things above not on things that are on this earth, for you have died. And that means my life as it used to be should be over. And my life should be hidden. It should be bound up with Christ in God. And then when Christ, if I got that attitude, who is your life appears and he's coming back, I'm going to meet him in the air. Then you will also appear with him in glory. And I'm going to come back at the end of that tribulational period, dressed, it says, in fine linen, and I will be on the winning side of all this. If you're not ready, we told you what to do. Admit that God is in charge. Realize you don't measure up. Know God should punish you for your sins. Believe that Christ came to live in your place. Understand that Christ suffered for your sins. Wholeheartedly turn from your sins. Trust in all that Christ did for you. And then from this point on, live like Christ is your boss. Was that clear last night? It is the only response to this message. Because to say, hey, let's just get a, uh, a trip up to heaven in the rapture. Well, that's one thing. But to say, if I don't, what's coming? Here's what's coming. What's coming is a bad time called the Great Tribulation. I'd like you to be ready if you're not ready. Here's the eight steps. Hopefully you've discussed those in your small groups. If not, tonight's the night to work through that list and make sure you're there. Make sure you can say to all eight of those things, that's true of me. Because that is a summary of the gospel of the New Testament. Let's pray. God, help us to respond rightly to this message tonight by getting our hope and our heart where it should be. As Jesus warned us 2,000 years ago, we ought to store up for ourselves treasure in heaven. We should have in our hearts a kind of love and hope and expectation of the next life. Start getting that treasure in place right now, knowing that thieves can't break in and steal it. Rust isn't going to destroy it. It's going to last forever. But this world and all the things the world is offering right now that are taking me in the direction away from you, that just we've got to realize what a ripoff that is. The world and all its desires are passing away. You've been patient, just like all those people that mo- mocked Noah when he was building that ark. I mean, there's a lot of people today that think this is all nonsense, but every single promise in your Bible has come true. 
And now you've got a whole set of promises about what's coming at the end of this, this period of time, this season that we're in right now. It's going to end with a great tribulation unlike any other period of time that's ever taken place on the planet. God, I pray that we would be ready for the day that you come back to take us home. And then when you come to destroy this world, when you start pouring out your anger on this world, when the people of this world are trying to put their hope in this great leader, the Antichrist, great in terms of powerful at least, he's not a great leader, he's a man of lawlessness. We can enjoy that marriage supper of the Lamb and be there with you instead of here on this earth when all this horrific stuff starts dominating this planet. So God, I pray that we'd have some students in this room tonight that would get right with you, that right now they would see who you are and who they are. You're perfect, you're holy, you're just, you're loving, you're our creator, you're in charge, and we're sinful. We need Christ to save us. Let us call out to you, just like it says over and over in the Bible. We just say, save me, God, save me. Save me from the penalty of my sin. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Make sure that I'm taken when Christ comes back for his church. And in this world, we'll have tribulation, but God, we're, we're ready for the world to press against us and to give us trouble. We just don't want you to press against us as non-Christians when the great tribulation strikes. So get us ready even now in Jesus' name.